everybody! Okay, we've got to get going. First of all, I need to say one quick shout out to someone who is not here. Um, but Gemma, age seven, apparently watches these on a night with her mum. Is that nice? That is a bedtime story. So, sweet, sweet jeans, Gemma. <laughs> we are launching straight into an enormous fat story time. I've got a story time which is going to explain the foundations of how earthquakes work and then we'll do the rest of the lesson. So, here is our first character. He is, sadly for him, he's not the main character in the earthquake story. This is Alfred Vegener. In 1910 he suddenly thought, hello, it looks like Africa and South America sort of might fit together quite snugly, like a jigsaw. Mm. So he went home, very excited, and he cut shapes of all the countries and the continents out of newspaper, and he stuck them together, and sure enough, it looked like he was right. He managed to get it so that a lot of the continents and countries did all fit together really quite nicely. He thought, hang on, I'm onto something here. I think all the countries of the world, all the continents of the world, Africa and South America and all that, I think they used to be in different places and they've moved around. Now, he got even more excited when he did some studying and new pieces of evidence started to come in. So, for example, this is a mesosaur. It's a lizard. It went extinct a really, really long time ago and we've only found mesosaur fossils in two places. We found them on the tip of South America and one other place, can you guess where? Yeah, in Africa. What is that about, eh? But the mesosaur, it was only a metre long, it was tiny, there was no way a little mesosaur would have been able to swim all that way between South America and Africa. So uh, so Alfred Vegenet thinks, goodness me, I, th I think this idea might be right. I think the continents and the countries might used to have all been bunched up together in a different order. And there's more evidence. He looks at the rocks in South America and, you know, like a lot of rocks, if you've been to the seaside, you've seen cliffs, they're in very specific layers. He looks at the rocks in uh, Africa and they look just the same. They match up perfectly. He is super excited now. And even more evidence comes in, like for example, in Antarctica, where it's freezing cold, we've found fossils of tropical plants, suggesting that Antarctica used to be somewhere very warm. Now, Alfred Vegener is incredibly excited. He's discovered something which will change humankind forever. What a brilliant piece of news. Um, if you've ever been in a supermarket, okay, bear with me, and you've wanted some biscuits, maybe you've said to the adult with the money, hey, can we get some biscuits? Because that will give me loads of energy to do loads of exercise. And maybe the adult might have said, um, oh, yeah, okay, well, yeah, that's, that's quite a good point, actually. And then maybe because you're getting excited and you can see that things are going your way, you might say, um, and uh, biscuits would be a really good reward for if I do loads of housework tomorrow. And the adult might say, oh, well, yes, but oh, housework, yeah, that's, that's quite good. And then you might get really, really excited because you know you're going to get biscuits. You might say something silly like, um, and, and biscuits are really good for me. And you might look at the adult's face, start to frown. And you might think, oh, I've pushed it too far. As the adult says, no, no, they're not, they're not good. No, come on, let's get some bananas. This is basically what what Alfred Vegener did to the science world. He got so excited, he used all this brilliant evidence and then he just started saying other things that didn't really make any sense. And in the end, uh, this is a quote, someone said, he was taking liberties with our planet. People didn't believe what he was saying. They thought he sounded like absolute nonsense. And Alfred's other problem was that he couldn't explain how on earth all the countries and the continents of the world could have moved around like this. So, poor Alfred. It was difficult, Alfred. It was difficult for you because people found it really difficult to get a big picture of the world. There weren't any satellites, there weren't any computers. Geologists, people who study rocks, were still looking at rocks through, um, through microscopes. Now, that's all very good, but you're not going to get a lovely big picture, are you, of what the world's like by looking at things through a microscope. And then an event happened which would change, uh, well, humans forever. World War Two. Now, wars cause a lot of pain and destruction, and they also cause a lot of new things to be invented. So, um, suddenly, governments wanted to know what was on the sea floor in case there was any danger there. So they 
invented echolocators that could look at the seafloor. Uh, they invented big magnetic uh, sensing machines that could detect things like submarines. Uh, but when the war was over, scientists got to use all this stuff uh, for whatever they wanted. And they looked at the seafloor with this equipment and they saw something absolutely incredible. This is an artist's representation of what they saw. If you look at the sea floor, you just see a load of sand and crabs. But if you turn on a machine that is sensing magnetism, you'll notice there's like a big crack. And then can you see that either side of the crack? It's symmetrical. It's the same, isn't it? Look, blue, pink, green, blue, pink, hash green. This is what scientists thought. This secret had been lurking at the bottom of the ocean for billions of years. And, and we discovered it. But we still didn't know what to do with that information. Enter. Dan Mackenzie. Dan Mackenzie has been called the greatest living British scientist. Like our character last week, he went to university and he studied Brooks, but he also studied physics. Now this was a really unusual and cool combination and it meant that Dan Mackenzie used his own brain about things and didn't just trust what everyone else had said because he had a little bit more information than everyone else. Um, like at the time, a lot of people said that earthquakes were caused by explosions happening under the ground. Now, Dan McKenzie knew enough to say, no, I don't think that is true. He went to America to study and on his campus at university, there was one computer. If you picture the the university being like a small town, there was one computer, it was miles away from where he was, because uh, this was the 60s. It cost $300 an hour to use the computer. And um, Dan said that it took him three weeks, this is absolutely true, it took Dan, who wanted to learn about computers, three weeks to print off one, two, three, four. That is absolutely true. But Dan didn't give up with this dreadful computer and in the end he used it to write a paper saying that he thought that the earth was made up of plates which were all separated from each other and moved around and that that's how the countries and the continents might be moving around. Now, he had used computing and no one had done that before so people started to pay a bit more attention but his true amazing breakthrough came when another war threatened to happen. So in the 60s, okay, maps weren't very good. If you mapped out in the 60s where all the earthquakes in the world were happening, you'd have probably just got something like this. Doesn't really tell you anything, does it? Because these dots could have been 3,000 kilometers uh, wrong. Like they could have been 3,000 kilometers that way or that way or that way or that way. Then suddenly government started worrying about nuclear war and they really wanted to know where other countries were keeping their bombs which meant that we got very good at knowing where things are. And the new map of where all the earthquakes in the world were happening looked like this. Now, if I said to you, hey, I think that the earth might be made up of big plates and that when those plates rub together, earthquakes happen, and I showed you that map, do you think you'd be able to tell me where the big plates in the world are? Yeah, I think you probably would. Dan McKenzie was incredibly excited when he saw that. And he used the computer like he'd never used it before. And in two days, he'd written to a very, very famous science magazine with his ideas. And the results were astounding. Dan McKenzie was absolutely right. The whole surface of the earth is made up of plates. Think of them as being like big curved paving stones. And uh, they move around in different ways, and the way they move makes different things happen. So on the sea floor, earth plates are moving apart, and lava is coming out onto the ocean floor and creating new ground. So that is very slowly pushing the countries away from each other. Sometimes the plates move towards each other and one ducks under the other one and scrapes along it, and all the ground being scraped off produces mountains. That's how the Himalayas were made. And we have found fossils of fish on top of the Himalayas, some of the highest mountains in the world, because they used to be on the bottom of the ocean floor. And then they, because they were on the edge of a plate, they got pushed up and up and up and up. And the last way is that they can slide against each other. And every time these plates move and slide and bump against each other, 
earthquakes happen? Well, suddenly, Dan McKenzie was only 24, by the way, when he wrote this paper, and he went from being just a young person who no one really listened to, to suddenly being invited to all the top parties. Suddenly, Dan McKenzie said, you, uh, you looked very silly if you didn't believe in this idea, which we call the theory of plate tectonics. If Alfred Wegener had been able to see how the Earth had received that idea, I think he would have had a very smug smile on his face. Indeed. Well done, chaps. Take a bow. Whew, so, so what an absolute mammoth story time that was. But I thought it's really important that you understand this idea of plate tectonics before we do earthquakes. So, whole surface of the earth is made of, is like covered in paving stones and the gaps in the paving stones, sometimes lava comes out, sometimes they push against each other, but every time they move against each other, uh, we get earthquakes. And earthquakes are basically just waves of energy traveling through the earth, but earthquakes also cause other things to happen. So we'll look at those first. Uh, when you thought of landslides, what did you picture? you picture a landslide what did you think about what I pictured was um, a car moving along the side of a mountain probably with bad guys in it and it gets to a certain point in the mountain and there's a loud noise a um, little bit of earth like some pebbles fall onto the road and uh, the bad guys can't get any further and the good guys get away that that's what I pictured then I read about landslides and I realized of course, of course, that's not how slopes work, is it? Uh, do it now. If you've got a baking tray and a bean can, you could put the baking tray on a slope on the floor, put a bean can on top of it, watch it roll down. Does the bean can roll down the slope and get onto the floor and stop? No, of course it doesn't. That is very basic physics, isn't it? A bean can is quite heavy. It's got momentum. It carries on for a long time. And that's what these little stones do. So when um, an earthquake happened, a really big earthquake just off the coast of Peru. The waves of energy travelled all the way through the earth and reached one of the highest mountains in South America. And earth and ice clinging to the side of one of the highest mountains in South America came loose and started to fall. It didn't, it didn't fall and make a little pile here, did it? No. People who saw it said it looked like an ocean of rocks and ice and it swept through the valley. 55 meters per second this thing traveled. So it went as far as five of your houses in a row in one second down the mountain through a valley and wiped out a village seven and a half miles away. So we all need, well, I certainly need to change my idea of what I picture when I think of landslides. That's landslides, not to be confused with pyroclastic flows, which are stuff coming out of a volcano and then falling down. They're the ones that don't have any friction. You can watch the volcanoes lesson on YouTube if you want to know about that. This is just rocks rolling down a hill. Tsunamis then. Tsunami, Japanese word um, for, I think like coastal wave. Tidal wave is not quite right because it's not tides that cause tsunamis. It is earthquakes. Now again, when I pictured a tsunami, I pictured sunbathing on a beach, looking out to sea and seeing this enormous wave like in the distance traveling towards me and everyone getting up and running away. No, that's not what happens. When an earthquake happens under the sea, it sends a shockwave through the ocean. Um, it's as if a big paddle has pushed on the water. But actually, if you look out to sea in deep water, all you would see of a tsunami is maybe like a metre high wave. It's only when the wave gets to the shallow water that it starts piling up and piling up and piling up. Um, we'll, very, we'll very quickly do it. I'll see if we can, we'll make a little wave. So get your baking tray and some water. It's a very simple one, this. Just pour some water into a baking tray. Do you remember last week when I forgot the water and I had to go and fill a jug? life. That was the longest 29 seconds of my life. How, the, how good is this? Hello. That's weird, isn't it? That's light and reflections happening there. Hi. You could watch my rainbows lesson if you want to learn more about that. Um, all we're going to do is lift one corner of the tray if you've got some water in it and then just drop it. Don't be too hard, don't spill, but you should see 
you get a wave and um, it's not just one wave you get one big wave and then but then at the front of the wave you should see lots of little waves as the water kind of bunches up that's all I want you to look for and that is what happens when a little one meter high tsunami wave reaches a shore all the water piles up there you go um so yet yeah, someone's mentioned thailand there the biggest and most disruptive tsunami in history recorded history happened in um well in fact i will show you oh uh, by the way if there's any grown-ups in the room can you please uh, empty the water out of that baking tray now and dry it because we need it later. Thank you. Look, one of the biggest tsunamis, um, the ocean floor split between uh, Sumatra in Indonesia all the way up to Burma here. So this enormous split in the ground caused this shockwave of energy to travel at 166 metres per second. 166 metres per this teeny tiny little meter long wave came, 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 got to the shore, bunched up and bunched up and bunched up in the shallow water. And by the time it crashed onto the shore, it was 30 meters high, three houses high. Um, now, a, a way of putting it is you imagine the harm that like the coronavirus has caused just in the UK. Um, but we've had quite a lot of notice, haven't we? You know, it's, it's been, certainly in my house, it's been fairly calm, like the government goes on the news and it tells us what to do and it tells us what's happening. The harm caused, caused by that tsunami was like the harm caused in the UK times five and they didn't get any warning at all. It was just, you know, even people on the beach probably didn't get any warning. So this is why the people who study this stuff are absolute heroes because it's so important that the more we know about earthquakes, volcanoes, landslides, tsunamis, uh, the more we can help people to be really prepared for it. Now, what did you think of when I said earthquake? Did you picture the ground pulling apart with someone who'd been in the wrong place at the wrong time, like hanging off the edge? Um, that, that, I don't know about the person hanging off the edge, the ground can pull apart. Um, it can also move up and down. And what you saw in story time was that a big cause of earthquakes on land is when two plates, two tectonic plates that the Earth's made up want to move in opposite directions. Now rock is quite elastic. Um, so what happens is the plates move and the rock sort of stretches and stretches and stretches, might be over tens, hundreds of years, and then eventually, like an elastic band that's gone too far, it snaps. And that's what sends these shock waves through. Um, so the one of the most horrendous earthquakes was in nine, I want to say 1906 in San Francisco in America, and that caused the Earth to move to the point where if two people had been stood on either sides of the fall, um, if one person had stayed there, this person would have ended up six meters over here. That's how far the Earth slid across itself. Um, that earthquake was really devastating because if you imagine how neatly all the pipes under the ground are laid out by humans, imagine them all getting moved by six metres. The, the six metre move, it broke all the gas pipes so that the city set on fire, but it also broke all the water pipes so no one could put the fire out. Um, which leads me nicely to the next bit, just before we do our next experiment. What makes earthquakes so dangerous what makes the most disruptive damaging earthquake it's three things the first thing is where it is so obviously a earthquake in the middle of a desert isn't going to do as much damage as an earthquake where loads of people are living in their houses the other thing is how uh, deep into the ground it is the bit where the rock first breaks is called the focus of the earthquake and the bit on the ground um, where the earth shatters or moves that's called the epicenter of the earthquake so <clears throat> if the focus is less than 70 kilometers it's a shallow earthquake and that is the most dangerous and you get medium earthquakes deep ones this is a question for anyone who saw the volcanoes lesson you don't get any earthquakes deeper than 700 kilometers why is that yes it's because the rocks are very very hot so they're melted so Instead of snapping, they sort of do more like this. Yes, well done. The third thing that means that an earthquake is really damaging is just the size of it. 
how big it is. And uh, you can measure earthquakes in different ways. One of the ways we used to measure earthquakes, bring you down here with me now, because we're about to do something. Uh, you used to me measure earthquakes by how intense they were. And all that was, was people going round to people who'd, who'd had an earthquake and saying, like, how bad was it? And if no one felt it, it was a level one earthquake. If most people's chimney pots fell off, it was a level eight. Like maybe if books fell off shelves, it was a level three. What is wrong with that system of measuring earthquakes? Why is that not really a very good way of telling people how strong an earthquake was? We're going to do a little uh, demo now to find out. So dry off your baking trays. There we go. And if you've got some rice with you, then we'll do the demo and that'll answer the question. Just put rice on half of the baking tray, please. There we go. <laughs> 41 and a half year old enjoying this, that's good. That's what it's about. So put rice on half your baking tray, and then if you've got some bean cans or... Uh, Oh yeah, because people could say different things. Yeah, people could lie and remember in a different way. Yeah, that is a very good... Oh, subjective and not quantifiable. Those are good words. Yeah, it's it's just having to rely on what people say and not properly measuring something. That is true. Um, so what I want you to do is put two bean cans on top of the little rice pile on your baking tray and two bean cans just on the normal surface of the baking tray. And all you're going to do is hold the middle of the baking tray and making sure that you haven't got any toes or dogs, Louise, or anything like that that's going to get squashed by a falling bean can, just give your baking tray a little shake. Okay? These are our buildings. And let's give it a shake. Hey, look at that. <laughs> it's so simple, but I just it amuses me every time. I love it. There's just something about watching heavy things fall over. Thomas and Emily, people measure differently. Yeah, that's true. People could measure differently. Although, if... um. If your chimney pot fell off, you'd, you'd, you'd think you'd be pretty sure about that, wouldn't you? Because the earthquake would have already happened. Priya, age 11. Yes, that's a brilliant point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a very good point. It's not much use warning people, is it, about something that's already happened? Well, th this is to show you why it's not a great way of measuring earthquakes. Because if you were living in a really sandy area, or if your house didn't have very good foundations, hadn't been built on very solid ground, maybe all your books would have fallen off your shelf. But if you'd built your house on some solid rock down the road... Um, your house might have been fine. Two people living really quite near each other could have totally different sized earthquakes, couldn't they? So there's no, you can't really put a number on an earthquake. It's like, it, well, it was a size three over there, it was a size four over there. So Emma's already mentioned a chap called uh, Mr. Richter. A chap called Mr. Richter came up with a different scale, which was using mathematics uh, calculations to look at how much energy is produced by an earthquake and that turned out to be a much better way of doing it so i'm going to show you my new favorite website you need to go on this when this is over it tells you what earthquakes have happened um today so here's a map red is earthquakes that have happened today yellow is earthquakes that have happened in the last two weeks and you probably can't see very well and it's backwards but down here it's telling me what size they were. So if I go to a red one here, look. So, uh, do, 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 do. There we go. So on May the 20th, in the uh, Kuril Islands, there was a size 4.4 earthquake. Uh, what's this one over here? So go on. Uh, that was a 4.5 in Panama. And this enormous yellow one is in uh, Nevada, and that was a 6.5. But what do those numbers actually mean? We use a slightly different scale to the Richter scale now, but it works in a similar way. And to, to show you how we measure earthquakes now, I need to tell you another little story. And luckily for me, it involves rice. So the story goes, once upon a time, there was a king in India who was very, very good at playing chess. And anyone who came into his kingdom uh, he challenged them to a game of chess. Now, one day, a very wise man came through the kingdom. And <laughs> it's like I'm making risotto on the carpet between the water and the rice. Oh, s sorry, Emma. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Dinner is solved. Uh, a wise old man travelled through the kingdom and the king said, Hey, 
come play chess with me. I'm really good at chess, so if you win, you can have whatever you like. And the wise old man said, oh, I don't want much. Just pay me in rice. Um, put one grain of rice on the first chess square if I win, and then uh, you can just double it and put that on the next chess square. Double it, put that on the next chess square. Double it, double it, double it. Uh, and I'll just have that much rice. So they played chess. And the king lost the game. So he called for a sack of rice so that he could give the wise old man his payment. And look what happened. Okay, So just like the wise old man had said, the king put one grain of rice on the first square. And then on the second square, he put double that amount. What is uh, one times two? Yep, it is two. And then he doubled that amount for the next square. So two times two is four. And then he doubled it again for the next square. So four times two, I hope you're doing this with me, is eight. And then double eight is 16. And then he doubled that, which is 32. I'm not going to do it all. And then he doubled that, which is 64. And then he doubled that, which is 128. Now, quickly, the king realised that he'd made a terrible mistake. Because by the time he got to the 20th square, just doubling the amount of rice meant that on the 20th square, he had to put 1 million grains of rice. And on the 40th square, he had to put 1 billion grains of rice. And on the 64th square, so the story goes, he had to put 210 billion tonnes of rice, which is apparently, according to the internet, enough rice to cover the whole of India one metre deep which is when the wise old man said, uh, don't worry, you don't have to pay me all straight away. Uh, and the wise old man became the richest man in India. Why does that story have anything to do with earthquakes? It's because the scale that we use to measure earthquakes uh, doesn't double, it times is by 10. So earthquakes can be like millions of times bigger or smaller than each other. A level three earthquake is like 10 times bigger than a level two earthquake which is 10 times bigger than a level one earthquake. So you see like, oh, a one and a three, they seem quite close together, but actually there's a um, there's hundred, the level three is a hundred times bigger than the level one. It's a bit like the grains of rice, but instead of doubling, you times it by 10. So that level six in Canada, that was a big deal. Um, hopefully there weren't many people there. Right. Now, how the Richter scale worked is, and how we measure earthquakes at the moment, is with something called a seismometer. And seismometers produce little graphs like this. So this is a super simple one. This, this one wouldn't really happen. But this is one telling you about how the Earth moved. So if you've got a seismometer, it wobbles when the Earth wobbles, and you might get a graph like this. And this would tell you that the Earth moved up a little bit and then moved back down to its normal position. So this one... A little bit more complicated, the earth moved up and then it moved down even lower than it was before and then it moved back to its normal position. And this is a real uh, seismogram from a seismometer. You can see here we've got some nice labelling of the different waves. So earthquakes produce different waves, P waves which travel really really fast and go right through the earth and S waves which arrive a little bit later at the equipment than the P wave and travel through the surface of the earth. So what we are gonna do now is build a little size monitor. So what I want you to do is uh, get your bean cans, get a piece of A4 paper, and just fold your A4 paper in half this way, lengthways. Okay, so you've got an A4 piece of paper, you folded it in half, and then just cut that piece of paper in half. Alright, so you've cut it in half, you've got two bits like that, and you're just going to sellotape them together. Just reading the comments. How did he get rich with rice? Yeah, that's true, he could have sold it. I don't know if it actually happened. So stick those bits of uh, paper together. And that's just going to be the paper that we use for our seismogram. There we go, like that. Now, we are going to build a seismometer which measures, measures movement up and down. So what I'd like you to do is put your bean cans nicely far apart and then sellotape the paper to your bean cans so that you've got a piece of paper which is upright, which you can write on. Okay, that's what I'm doing. A little piece of sellotape on this side of the paper. 
and just stick it to the lowest bean can and then do the same on the inside. A pair of bean cans with a nice long strip of paper and now we're going to make the thing that will write on this seismogram for us. Uh, so you should have some sort of elastic band and a mug and a pen and some sellotape. What you're going to do is tape a pen to the bottom of your mug. So hold your mug by the handle like that. You're just going to tape a pen to the bottom of the mug. That's why I said make it your best pen so that it's a nice sensitive seismogram. So you've got, you've got your pen stuck on your mug and we're going to get your elastic band and just thread it through the mug. If you've got a little one, or a sort of medium sized one, um, then you might want to put it through like that and then thread one end through the other so that it, to make it as long as you can. You see what I mean by that? And all you're going to do is, um, it works better if the elastic bands are a bit spread out on your hand, like that, you see. All you're going to do is move your mug along the seismogram and imagine that on a real seismogram, a piece of metal anchors this equipment to the ground, but you are going to have to play the part of the piece of metal and pretend that the earth is moving up and down and move your pen along the paper and see what happens. Let's do it. Okay. So I'll start here. So I'm just going to move along, move along, nothing's happening, no earthquake, nothing to see here. And then the earth starts moving. And then maybe it stops again. But then you know what happens after an earthquake? Aftershocks! As the rocks settle down again. Oh! <laughs> And there you go, that is actually quite a good example of how uh, size McGrams work. That is actually fairly accurate. Now, while you're playing with those, I'm going to show you how with the mere addition of a wooden spoon, you can do another one which measures different motion. There you go, that's the other one with a wooden spoon. Looks a bit cooler, doesn't it? Um, but I thought it was a bit too much to set up. Oh, Freya, five. I'm glad you're liking this. So try this one afterwards. Two bean cans and a wooden spoon and a mug dangling from it and a pen around the back like that, you see. Touching the baking tray. And then what you do is, this time, you thread your seismogram through here. If you pull that and you wobble the baking tray to and fro in front of hands. Here, you grab that. Thanks. And then you wobble the baking tray from side to side. I think that one's actually a bit better. Oh, so have a go with that at home. <laughs> the cup's going to break. Hopefully not, but I think I did say on the invite, uh, don't use your best mug. I guess there's just no point, is there? Um, cool, so that is how you measure an earthquake. Now, there are some people, I know, that, I know there's at least one cynical 10-year-old out there saying... Obviously, that is not how you measure an earthquake. Obviously, with today's science, you don't just attach a pen to a mug, do you? And, like, draw a picture when the ground moves. That is true. Okay, fine. Um, but it's actually not that wrong. What, what you do now is, and we'll, we might touch on this in our electricity lesson, but this is deep physics, is you get... What they do now is they've got a piece of copper wire and they put a magnet inside it. And every time a magnet moves inside a piece of copper wire, it gives off an electric signal. Uh, so the magnet moves up, it gives off a certain signal, it moves down, it gives off a certain signal. So it's more accurate. But but actually, that, that is really not a bad way. This, this is actually incredibly close to how they used to do it before we got a, bit, got a bit more accurate and started using more electricity. One very important thing to mention in all of this, all this brilliant science going on, is absolutely no use to anyone if you can't communicate the science to people to make them safer when landslides and tsunamis and earthquakes happen. Um, someone who nearly made it to story time, uh, but she didn't quite make it because I couldn't find out enough about her, is someone called the Earthquake Lady in America, who's this like big celebrity, but she's also an earthquake scientist. Like people find her and get her autograph and stuff. But it's her job now to tell people how to be safe. So she sort of makes makes the science exciting enough that she persuades people to nail bookcases to their walls so that if there's an earthquake they don't get hurt. Um, 
they did loads of computer modelling, which we talked about in the volcanoes lesson, and worked out that a lot of the fires that cause damage during an earthquake could be just put out with a fire extinguisher in people's homes. So if everyone has a fire extinguisher in their houses, that limits the damage a lot. Um, if people help each other out, if people reinforce their houses, that all helps. So science is brilliant, but you also have to persuade people to do what they want to do. It's a bit like in the UK when you get uh, fire people coming to your school and showing you about how, how important it is to have like smoke detectors. Um, the science is only useful if the people are actually following what the science says. Right, that is the end of our earthquakes lesson, except to say that this coronavirus has actually been quite helpful to um, people who study earthquakes because those seismograms used to pick up like trains going past um, all kinds of human activity has now stopped. So all these P waves and S waves traveling through the earth, um, we say there's a lot less noise. It's much, much more easy now to see what the earthquake waves are doing, which means that actually now is a really good time to study earthquakes because there's no background noise. I know, right? Um, right, that is the end of the lesson. Thank you so much for joining me. Except to say, uh, as usual, please like my Facebook page and please uh, subscribe to me on YouTube. It's so lovely when people do that. It's so nice. It is like uh, reaching a new level of a computer game, except like because people like you. It's really lovely. It's nice. Um, also, thank you so much to the people who've signed up to my Patreon page already. If you don't know about this, it's a way of you supporting me uh, monetarily per month. If enough people support with a very small amount per month, can carry on doing this so um, if you sign up with three pounds a month um, then you get access to the activity sheet that I've done for earthquakes and the other two but most of you probably already got those and uh, a cookbook which I've written which is about my favorite recipes and a little bit of science in there as well uh, if you sign up with five pounds a month oh, this just arrived today you get I'm gonna write a, an e-magazine every so often which is going to have competitions in it and we're big enough now that people are sending me stuff to give you by the competition which is awesome um and and there's there's a 10 pound month option as well but obviously only if you if you feel that you are capable of doing supporting at this time and it's a bit weird eloise age seven you love the show i would love a shout out all right well on that note then i'll say a proper bye everybody thank you for joining me and i'll see you next week for another lesson and then I won't actually go. Uh, I'll stop the video there when I'm editing it. And we can just chat and do shout outs. I put that you could reuse the rice, didn't I? And then like, as I was typing that, my two-year-old got hold of it. And it, it went all hairy. Maybe don't eat the rice. <laughs> if you're in Manchester, yeah, have fun making cold rice pudding. Karis says, bye! Bye, Karis! Didn't break down your Star Wars mug. <laughs> Everyone, Toby, well done. Why are you using that? <laughs> Oh, this is nice. People are already sending me messages of their um, half-naked children doing experiments. That's cool. What is the biggest landslide in the world? Oh, Josh, what a good idea. Um, I don't like, don't like to tell you things that are wrong. Oh, Aaron asking, what was the tallest tsunami ever? I believe that actually 30 metres, just over 30 metres is as high as they've got. So the one that happened in Sumatra, Aaron, that would be... Certainly one of the tallest. It's always a bit... I don't ever want to say, oh, it was the tallest, because... You know, we haven't been recording them all. But Josh, I think one of the biggest landslides in the world was this one that I talked about. Um, I mean, what does biggest mean? Fastest? I don't know. Most rocks? Now you're just watching me reading a science book. <laughs> this is absolutely terrible TV, I'm so sorry. It's one of the most destructive earthquake-induced landslides ever was that landslide in 1970, it was. Oh, because I meant to say it was the 31st of May. 1970. So it's the 50th anniversary of this horrendous landslide on Sunday. Jungles! Josh, nice! Jungles, yeah, that's very cool. All right, Iron Man suit, jungles, oceans. I've got it. We've got ages, haven't we? We've got ages. I'll see you soon. Bye!